Well, welcome everybody. Welcome Ski for Light. And uh, I'm Wendy David, and I'm just really delighted to um, to have you join us for another exciting presentation by Marvin Luer, who presented for us um, at our virtual ski event. And it was so popular, and there was such hot demand to hear it again. And when we realized it hadn't been recorded, he so graciously offered to do it again. And so. We're really grateful to Marvin for doing this. And let me just give you a couple facts about Marvin that you may not know. I asked Marvin, how did you hear about Ski for Light? And he said that in 1977, he read an article about Ski for Light in a cross country ski magazine and it caught his attention. So those of you who do our PR, remember what this got us in Marvin. Um, to his surprise, SFL was scheduled for Deadwood, South Dakota in 1978. And at that time, he only lived an hour's drive from Deadwood. He learned of the need for guides via local radio and newspaper paper announcements. And fortunately for us, Marvin picked up the phone and he made a call um, and the rest is history. Marvin's first Ski for Light was that 1978 event in Deadwood, South Dakota, and he has been a guide at the International Ski for Light events 34 times. Uh, he's also had one international virtual event, so 35. Uh, he's guided at the South Dakota regional event many times, and he was on the Ritterin team in Norway as a guide in 2002 where he and his skier at the time Dwayne Farrar both did their best best uh, speed his love and teaching has taught um, and inspired 16 first timers to ski for light and cross-country skiing and I'm really proud to say that Marvin was my very first SFL guide in 1993 when I first started coming and he inspired me then and infused the love of cross-country skiing and introduced me to this wonderful Ski for Light family um, then and I'm eternally grateful. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you Marvin Luer, who will share his story of no road, no power line, no mortgage, living a self-sufficient lifestyle in the 21st century. Thank you, Marvin. Well, thank you, Wendy. That was a, a very kind introduction. I hope I'm up to uh, take do a good job. I'll I'll say hello again to everyone. I first want to compliment Tim McCorkle, our Ski for Light president, Bonnie O'Day, the event chair, and all the board members and planners that work so hard to keep the spirit of Ski for Light alive during a somewhat of a difficult year. It certainly took a, a leap of faith and a lot of energy to put this all together. It just seems like it, Ski for Light doesn't end this winter because here it is in the middle of March and we're still getting together. It was really exciting for me to see so many names pop up on the screen and I can say I know most of you and those of that I don't, I'll probably get to meet you next year in Colorado. Sitting here in front of the screen and talking to you reminds me of an incident. One of my early ski for lights, probably in the 1980s. I was the guide of a first time skier named Rhonda and she was pretty timid and wasn't progressing very fast. And I think perhaps I got a little bit impatient and about the second day, she stopped in the tracks and says, Marv, you got to understand, I'm a little blind Jewish girl from New York City. My parents raised me in a very protective home. Just the fact that I'm out here in the mountains on the snow skiing with you itself is a miracle. That's about the way I feel sitting out here, this old gray haired man in the middle of Nebraska, communicating with people all over the world is somewhat unbelievable. One of the things that attracts me to Ski for Light is the people I meet. We come from all over the nation. In fact, 
also Europe. We have different occupations. We come from different homes, so with different races, different religious, different um, political beliefs, and yet we come together and then treat each other as just good human beings, good people. I guess that's kind of why I'm talking here again tonight and that I realize that my lifestyle is quite different from the rest of you. And so I suggested that I uh, present this talk and Wendy grabbed a hold of it and hasn't let go since. I'll start out by, well, as my title says, I live in a log cabin that I built pretty much by myself with iron tools, grow much of my own vegetables, hunt for some of my food, pump my own water. And you might wonder where this all idea all started. I think it's safe to say that this idea of, of wanting to live in somewhat of a backwoods lifestyle would have come from when I was a little boy on the farm. I was we didn't have electricity on the farm until sometime after I went to school. And our daily routine was filled with a lot of hard work. We had to milk the cows and feed the chickens, gather the eggs and feed the pigs, as well as go to school. And without electricity, hard labor was a part of our daily routine. And yet, after six days of work, we did honor Sundays by taking a day off. But it wasn't necessarily a day of rest and relaxation because we got up extra early to milk sh make sure we got the chores done before church. And after church, we were free to Alert. Audio now unmuted. Zoom meeting. You are go alerted. to the river. Audio. Most of the time, that's where we preferred to go. I and my brothers and cousins. We only lived a couple of miles from the Niobrara River. Alert. In the spring, Stop. we'd go fishing. In the summer, we would go swimming. In the fall, we hunted. In the winter time, we would skate on the ice. We didn't know there was such a thing as cross country skis then, or we probably would have been skiing also. But also, in addition to the recreation on the river, I enjoyed the, the natural environment, the trees, the grass, the wildlife, and I wanted to learn more about it. And felt like someday I would like to live in that type of environment. In uh, so after high school, I went to college, studied forest management, got a job with US Forest Service. And even though I worked quite a bit in the outdoors, I was still not quite satisfied because I felt I was just a visitor. My home was back in town on the main street. But the idea that someday I could build this cabin and live in the woods never really left me. And in 1986, it you could say it became a reality when I bought the land that I now live on. You know, I always said it's easy to get money. Go to, anytime you want to work, you can get paid. Anytime you go to a bank, you'll get a loan. But acquiring land is a little more difficult because especially here in rural Nebraska, it doesn't change hands very often. This property I live on, I'm only the fourth owner in the last over 120 years. So I felt really lucky when I was able to acquire this. At that time, I started more or less planning for the day when I could build my cabin in the woods. But I wasn't a true pioneer and I wanted some of the uh, comforts of life, I guess, which means some quite of an income. I didn't wanna to have to eke out a living on this small piece of property. It was 1986 when I bought the land and in 1990, uh, let's see, 19, 1986, 1994, the Forest Service authorized early retirement. They called it downsizing. I guess it was politically the thing to do was reduce the number of employees. And uh, I couldn't believe it. It was like winning the lottery they were going to pay me for the rest of my life a small retirement income if I would quit early. So I jumped at the chance. It was, the timing was right. My, I had two daughters. My oldest daughter would 
graduated from college and was recently employed. My other daughter, Anne, only had a semester of college left. And their mother and my wife had died a few years earlier. So I really had no family responsibilities to consider other than taking care of myself at this time. So in April, I signed the papers for early retirement. And in May, I loaded up my old farm pickup and, and headed out actually about 300 miles from where I was living then. At that time, I was in Western Nebraska. Now I'm in Central Nebraska. One of the nice things about the summer was my youngest daughter came with me when she found out what I was going to do. She said, Dad, I'm coming along. And so we had a, a real good summer to start our green property. We set up a big wall tent and used that as our bedroom. We built a picnic shelter, which we used for the, the kitchen. We pumped our water out of pumped our water through a filter system because it had to come from the river at that time. When I planned this cabin, I decided it was going to be something that would blend in the environment and fit the, the natural landscape. All too often I see when people get their rural property, they bring in a bulldozer and more or less level it off and make it fit this house they want to build. And they end up with something that more or less belongs in the suburbs of Omaha rather than rural America. So I decided I would build it with hand tools. There was no electricity on the site, so that ruled out electrical power tools. I would not rent any equipment and I wouldn't hire any labor. I would use local materials as much as possible. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit here um, and mention Henry David Thoreau in the book Walden. I think perhaps reading this book some years earlier kind of influenced my thinking, even though I didn't realize it at the time. But after I got this building pretty well finished, a newspaper reporter from Omaha called and said he wanted to do a story. A mutual acquaintance had said he thought I had a good story for him. And I was, couldn't quite figure out what he was up to, but he brought a photographer up and they gave me a, a quite a spread in the Omaha paper. And he referred to me as Nebraska's version of Henry David Thoreau. So after that, I got my book out of the bookshelf and reread it, even though I had read it years earlier, and decided that by golly, maybe he was right, that Thoreau had built his cabin with no labor cost when he wanted help. He'd call on friends. When I wanted help, I'd call on my brothers or my nieces and nephews. As much as possible, he used materials on hand. I used logs upriver, ponderous of pine logs, and some used lumber and sawed some of my own lumber. He kept a detailed list of materials and what they cost. I had done the same. He built a guard or tilled a garden. One of his main crops was beans. And I, I have to admit that that's probably the most productive vegetable I get out of my garden. I'm going to read a quote from Henry David Thoreau's book, Walden. Um, Most men appear never to have considered what a house is and are actually, though needlessly poor all their lives because they think they must have such a one as their neighbors have. And that really fit the plans I had. When I built this or planned this house, I didn't look to what my neighbors had. And I think this probably applies to more than just building a house. I see too many people stressed out financially because they keep buying things to keep up with, uh, with their neighbors and perhaps it doesn't add anything to the quality of their life. So using ponderosa pine logs pretty much dictated the size of the building because most of the trees in Nebraska, you can't get much more than a 24 foot log out of them. Um, 
I planned the house by cutting willows about one inch in diameter, cut them into sticks 24 inches long, which represented the logs of 24 feet and build a scale model of a log cabin. From there, I cut little pieces of cardboard into furniture to see if it would all fit. And I come to the conclusion that 16 by 24, 384 square feet would be a little bit smaller, even smaller than what I as a, as a single man would needed. So I decided I would put in a, a basement if it looked feasible. And I dug some holes in the ground and it looked like a, a good dry place. And it was a south facing slope, which meant I could have windows on the south side to let full sign laid into the basement and end up with more or less a finished basement. I wanted the, the main structure to be wood, either logs or wood that I sawed from lumber on my own place. And I, I guess maybe being a forester, I appreciate wood, but wood is a remarkable material. I think perhaps we take it for granted. First of all, it's something we can grow, it's, it's renewable. But you can take a piece of wood and you can saw it with a saw, you can chop it with an ax, you can drive a nail into it, put a screw into it, you can paint it, you can use it to cook your food, to warm your house. And when you're finished with it, it could just deteriorate and melt right back into the ground, a very remarkable substance. I think if you lived on an island, and you had no trees and somebody introduced trees and you suddenly had wood, you would call it one of a miracle. The uh, first job in building this, of course, was to dig the hole for the basement and put in the cement foundations, the cement floor, I didn't hire any equipment to do that, but the old farm tractor that I true grew up on was still back on dad's farm. My mom and dad only lived four miles from here. And I had an old scoop that was used by, pulled by a team of horses, except we pulled it with a tractor. And I got my nieces and nephews, my daughter Ann down there to help. And we proceeded to, to dig in the dirt. This is hard work, especially in the month of July, since we were down where there was no wind, but it was kind of rewarding work. As you dug through the different layers of soil, you begin to realize how this land was put together. Once the machine work was done, we had to actually using the scoop left a rather concave egg shaped hole. Much of the work was then done with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. But in a month's time, we had a hole suitable for the basement foundation. I might add a, a backhoe could have done it in two or three days, but we elected, I elected at least to do it the hard way. Once the basement wall was dug, we poured cement. Again, we used materials from the land. We hauled in sand from the river bank, dipped water out of the river, carried it up or put it in a tank and carried it up to the site and mixed the cement on site. We did have a cement mixer that fed a small farm tractor that I was able to borrow. After the cement walls were poured and the cement floor was poured. I, I built up cement, or actually I, I poured this, the footings for the cement walls and the cement, the blocks were used for the walls. It took about 800 blocks to build this foundation walls and each one weighed about 40 pounds. Needless to say, I didn't have to go to the fitness club at the end of the day to get my exercise. 
once the cement walls were constructed, I built the floor. The floor was pretty much uh, conventional construction, two by 10 floor joists that spanned the cement walls, tongue and groove plywood on top. From there, we covered it with tar paper and plastic. And I had a shelter that was essentially warm and dry. I put in a barrel stove and a table and I had a place I could stay for the winter. Now I wasn't there all winter long. I still had a home back in Western Nebraska, which I had some unfinished business to do. And I spent some time with my parents at the farm home. But it was nice to say I finally had a had the shelter, so to speak, in a, in a natural environment. I might add my grandfather homesteaded in this area and he built a dugout and that was his only place to live for the first two or three winters until he was able to carry a, build his farmhouse. The next spring began the log work. I elected to use raw logs. I didn't cut them myself, but I had them hauled in with a logger. I hand peeled them with a draw knife and a bark spud. This again was hard work, but I was thrilled with the idea that I could construct my own home. Once the logs were peeled, I hewed them. A hewed log is basically flat on the inside and the outside. In other words, I, the finished log walls are more or less level and plumb. This not only was a, a good way to build the logs, it worked well with the ponderosa pine logs because our logs in Nebraska were a little bit crooked and using the ax and a chalk line, you could straighten the logs out, so to speak. Yet it took longer than I thought. I think there was probably, there were 40 logs at 25 feet a piece. That would be 1,000 feet, 300 yards. If these logs would have been stretched out end to end, I probably would have never started. But I had them in a pile and only took out one log at a time. And somehow it seemed like I could get to the end of that log. Um, I was kind of reminded me of a quote I'm going to give you from my late father-in-law. He was a man that had many skills. He could carpenter, he could pour cement, he could do mechanical work. And whenever he completed a rather tough job, he would rub his hands together and say, no job too tough. Some just take longer. I'll repeat that. No job too tough. Some just take longer. And that's what I would tell myself when at the end of the day, I might only get one more log done. Actually, it took me a lot longer than I initially planned on. Planned on. But I began to realize that by hewing these logs and straightening them out and putting my hand labor into it, I felt more like a sculptor than I did a, a, a carpenter. And I could see this building as being kind of a work of art. If you take a camera and snap a picture, you can, in a few minutes, send that all over the world. But if you hire, have a artist come in with his canvas and paints, it might take much longer. But one is nothing more than a snapshot. The other is a work of art. I wanted this to be a work of art. By fall, I did have the logs pewed or log hewed. I cut notches, dovetail notches in the ends and begin stacking the logs. And by October, I had the logs up. At this time, I was quite exhilarated because I could see now that this project was feasible. Up until now, I wasn't sure I could really do it because the log work was something that was really new and different. But the log structure was looked kind of like a giant 
cage made out of logs. There, there are cracks between the logs in this type of construction, and it looked like a cage big enough to, or strong enough to hold an elephant. But I felt like if I can do this, I can do anything. Yeah, the old ski for light motto. If I can do this, I can do anything. The next job was to put the roof panels on. The roof was more or less standard construction uh, that what you'd use on a modern home. In this case, it was seven and a half inches of styro rigid foam bonded to particle board on the, both sides. And the panels were 13 feet long, four feet wide, and they were placed on the roof frame. Again, I used the old farm tractor with the loader, improvised a sort of a boom on the end of the loader that we could lift those panels and put them into place. Once again, I called on my brother to assist in, in this project. But it made me feel kind of good because when I bought the panels from the, from the uh, company, they said I'd have to hire a crane I said, no, I wasn't going to hire a crane. He said, you will have to hire a crane, but I proved him wrong. Once the roof was on, it, it was time to shingle it. I got that finished and did the chinking. Chinking is the material you put in between the logs because there are cracks in the logs, between the logs in this method of construction. The original homesteaders used either clay and straw or else cement. In my case, I used a commercial product that come in five gallon buckets. It, it, it's a material that dries into a rubbery substance and kind of shrinks and swells the same as the wood so it doesn't peel away and it's proved very successful. Once the chinking was done, the roof was on, it was time to do work on the interior. In the basement, I sawed some red cedar logs into lumber to panel part of the, the lower part of the basement. On the wall, if you, you see some mementos from Ski for Light, a Jansport pack, which was, or two Jansport packs that were gifts from, from Jansport as a Ski for Light guide. I've also got some ice skates and a baseball mitt that I used when I was in high school. The quilts on my bed were made by my daughters. They're very much a part of this, this whole effort. Upstairs, I have most everything on the wall is some personal connection or a gift from somebody. But I have the usual Western deer antlers hanging on the wall, uh, beaver skin. Again, a quilt that my daughter's built for me. I've got a kerosene lamp on the table. The table was made out of an oak tree that I cut from the place. And I have windows on the south, which let in a lot of natural light. The last work of the cabin was to add a covered deck or porch on the outside. And once again, I used, if you see the cedar or the railings are made out of red cedars that I cut out of the canyons and peeled each one, sanded it. Red cedar is a natural resistant wood or resistant to rot and it's worked out very well. And I might add this open porch is, is almost like another room. The house, this cabin is really bigger than it looks. In the summertime when it's hot, I do much of my cooking out here on a two burner stove rather than let it get heat up the house on the inside. I could go into a lot of details with the construction of the cabin, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. But for some of you that might be interested, I did write a 10 page technical paper complete with diagrams and pictures. And it's in, in the University of Nebraska Digital Library. If you go to Google and put in 
Marvin Lure, Nebraska Log Cabin. A link should pop up, which will allow you to see some of the detailed construction of, of this particular building. <coughs> I don't have any power line down there. A power line would have cost more than the cabin because it's over a mile from the existing line. But I do have a small electrical system powered by the sun. The solar panel feeds electricity either directly into the house or into the batteries. The batteries carry me through the night and the snowy days like we have today. In the basement, I have a cast iron or a wood stove, wood heating stove. And it works very well. The cement walls soak up the heat. And even though the fire goes out, it's several hours later before you begin to feel the chill. On the walls here, you also see a beaver skin, a fur from a skunk, a raccoon, a muskrat, and a canoe paddle, which I carved out of an, an ash tree. Upstairs, I have a cast iron cook stove that I cook on about 10, well, eight months out of the year. And when it gets too hot in the summer, I usually either use a two burner stove or a solar oven. You can buy what they call solar ovens for three, $400 on the internet. I elected to build one. It's really nothing more than a heavily insulated box with a glass lid on. And in the summertime, when the sun shines, it works works surprisingly well, as long as you plan ahead three or four hours before your meal. I have a root cellar, which is basically a below ground structure, which is the cement walls, cement floor, cement roof. Once you get three or four feet below ground, four feet or more, it never freezes. The temperature varies from 35 degrees in the winter to about 65 in the summer. This was an essential part of most homestead living in that it serves very well to store crops like potatoes, carrots, apples, and uh, canned food. I can leave in the winter time and it never freezes. I get my water from a well a hand pump. I, water fascinates people. You find most people, if they can, they love to live along the lake, the shores of a lake or along the ocean or along a river. But water coming out of a, the ground is also interesting. Whenever people come to visit, we go for a drink and they just seem to marvel that you can take water directly out of the ground and find it clean and pure. And on the kids and grandkids come to visit, I never have to bring my own water to the house because they seem to be fascinated with pumping their own, their own well or their own water. I have a, in the summertime, I shower with the solar heated water, sun heated water. It's just a black bag you lay in the sun and by the end of the day, it'll be too hot to shower in until you cool it off. You, many of you that can't probably use these from time to time yourself. In the winter time, obviously I have to heat my water on the, on the stove, which is an inconvenience, but when you don't have to go to town to a job, I have the time to do that. I mentioned not having a road my, I have my primary access is a foot trail. You can get a vehicle down here when the conditions are right, meaning no snow, no rain, et cetera, no slick, no even because it's a steep hill. But I use the, the trail that way I get my daily exercise in because I like to get my mail. I still get mail at the mailbox. And I find that walking down here on a foot trail is one of the things that it, people find attractive. I actually get more visitors than I would if I lived uptown. I'm going to read to you a piece I wrote for a magazine some years ago. And they 
printed it. It's called the view from our place. I have a hiking trail leading to my log cabin on the Niobra River near Butte, Nebraska. The view of the river and the walk surrounding hills is so grand, I preferred walking to the cabin to riding there in a vehicle. Scenes of prairie grasses, flowers, wooded canyons, and meandering river channels unfold as they round each bend in the trail. The experience is never the same as new grasses and flowers seem to pop up every day in the spring and summer. Cool fall weather brings brilliant colors, starting with the sumac and its red leaves. In winter, the frost, snow, and freezing river channels paint on an ever-changing picture. Walking across the landscape is like reading a giant textbook with each new season, a new chapter, and each day a new page. Visitors are surprised to find such colorful scenery in a state better known for its cornfields and treeless plains. My two daughters helped me build this cabin before they were married. I feel especially blessed now when they, with their five children and husbands, enjoy the view from my place. Another visit I enjoy is sometimes the teacher will bring their school children down here for a field trip. Now, when they bring them down for pioneer history or natural resource management, I kind of understand it. But one of the teachers brings her English class down. And that puzzled me at first, but she had a she used this to introduce the children to American literature and such people as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And it goes over really well. I still remember one of the younger kids, uh, one of the requirements is when they get back home to their classroom, they have to write a letter to me, a handwritten letter, something that most people don't do much nowadays. But one of the letters I really remember was a youngster, this was probably a second grader, who said, school is normally boring for me, but yesterday I had a blast. And that made me feel good. At least I give that kid one good day in school. When my children, grandchildren come down here, they have to be ready for all kinds of weather. And on one occasion, in a late spring snowstorm, they got, we, we got dumped on. And there was so much snow that when they walked out, there was time for them to go back home. I carried a scoop shovel to scoop through some of the get drifts because when a, you're only three foot tall as my youngest grandchild was, a three foot drift is a little bit insurmountable. On another occasion, it rained and rained and rained. Like today, it rained all day today, but they were prepared. They donned their ponchos and their, their rubber boots, and they seemed to enjoy heading out, slopping through the rain on their way back home. And sometimes the weather is ideal. We all get together for a family picnic and invite the other brothers, nieces and nephews down for a, a campfire meal. I mentioned having a garden. I, I can quite a bit of the food. I can pickles, beans, tomatoes. I also can some of the deer meat. I hunt for deer and turkeys, can some of that meat. And I guess I feel fortunate that most of my food I can trade is, say is truly organic. I know exactly where it comes from. In fact, most of it never leaves the place. I also can catch fish in the river. It is a kind of a unique piece of property in that you have so many resources available all within walking distance of where I live. Uh, there's also wild fruits that make jelly and also make pretty good wine.
Let's see here. I'm going to talk, put you guys into the, the story a little bit here. Some of you might say, well, that's kind of neat. I wish I could do some of that, but I know I can't from, live like that, but I can't from where I live. And yet there might be some ways you can get closer to your food source than you realize. It, my garden is not all that big. It's only about 30 feet by 50 feet, but you can also grow food just in just a few square feet. Um, a few, one suggestion would be tomatoes. I remember Richard Harris, a blind skier who's no longer with us, was telling me how it was very successful in growing his own tomatoes. He would set out the plants when they were about a foot tall, any little weeds that come up beneath, he could feel with his hands and keep the weeds out. And he learned by trial and error that be able to judge when a tomato was right by, by touching it. You could actually grow tomatoes in a, in, a, in a large bucket if you kept enough water and fertilizer there. Cucumbers can be planted along a fence or along a trellis and they grow horizontal rather than vertical, or grow vertical rather than horizontal and they don't take up much space. Pole beans again will climb a fence. They don't take up much space. Uh, Yolanda Shaw, who I skied with, has a, has a raised garden. She grows a few plants in her raised bed in the city of Austin, Texas. How about a fruit tree? Don't, Erica McCall grows grapefruit in her Tallahassee, Florida home. And those grapefruits turned out to be more worth more than the price of gold in the recent Ski for Light auction. Maybe you can bake your own bread. At the last Ski for Light session, Jeffrey Abrams gave us a tutorial on how to bake your own bread. He, he was a blind baker. I think uh, that's starting to get towards the end of my time, but I'm going to take enough time to, to read a book. Now you think, oh my gosh. We've endured all this, and now we're going to read a book. But it's it's really good. It's one my grandkids gave me. And at first, I thought it looked like a, a reading book you'd get when you're in first grade. But it's called Henry Builds a Cabin. As you can tell, it's a takeoff from Henry David Thoreau. And it, one day, Henry decided to build a cabin. He borrowed an ax and cut down the trees. Henry cut the logs into square beams. He notched the bottom beams to fill corner posts. The corner posts to fit into ceiling beams and the ceiling beams fit into roof beams. In April, his friend Emerson helped him raise the beams. Emerson being Ralph Waldo Emerson. He made him hungry. Henry, he said, your cabin looks too small to eat in. It's bigger than it looks, said Henry. And he led his friend to a bean patch he had planted behind the cabin. When it is finished, this bean patch will be my dining room. In May, Henry bought an old shed and took it apart. He nailed the boards in the floor, the roof, and the walls of the cabin. Henry was nailing the last board when his friend Elcott arrived. Henry, he said, your cabin looks too dark to read in. It's brighter than it looks, said Henry. And he led his friend to a shiny spot beside the cabin. When it's finished, this will be my library. In June, Henry put a door in front. Then he put two windows in the side walls. He bought old shingles for the roofs and floors. Henry was nailing the last shingle when Miss Lydia appeared in the window. Henry, she said, your cabin looks too small to dance in. It's bigger than it looks, said Henry. And he led her to the front of the cabin where a path curved down to the pond. When it's finished, this will be the ballroom with the grand stairway. 
On the 4th of July, Henry moved into his cabin. He ate beans in his dining room. He read in his library. And he danced down the grand stairway to the pond. When it started to rain, Henry ran back to his cabin. It's bigger than it looks, he said. This is just the room I need when it's raining. And that's kind of the way my life is to some extent. I live much in the outdoors. I don't need that big of a house. I think I'll wrap, wrap up this portion here by reading a paragraph from my journal. This log cabin is the culmination of many years of hard labor. Building this cabin was a physical and emotional journey to take ax and saw and translate my ideas into a comfortable home was a very satisfying experience. It reflects my ideas of responsible living. It has a personal value that cannot be replaced by any amount of money. Okay, Dave, take over. Thank you very much, Marvin, that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to open it in the forum up for questions. If you have a question for Marvin, please um, go to the reactions icon the button and just uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, Dee Dee. Hi Marvin, Dee Dee. Um, Hello. I've been just sitting here chuckling because so many of your stories remind me of the stories my parents told about building their house in Chicago. Um, so sometime at the ski for light, we'll have to have dinner together. I'll tell you their trials and tribulations. <laughs> but um, I was curious, how long did the whole process take? I say it took four years. Okay. I started about four years before I officially moved in. I moved in all my books and my business papers and, and my clothes. And there's always a few more things to do after that, but that's about what it was. Okay, cool. It's really, really fascinating. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. Uh, Peggy Martin. Hi, Marvin. You mentioned the magic word at near the very end, and that's dancing. So my question is, how did you become such a marvelous dancer? Because you are. You were the best dance partner I've ever had at Ski for Light, and you gave me lessons because you were so much better than I could pretend to be. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But I wonder if you're not thinking of Marvin Neville, who was my roommate. <laughs> he, he really loved to dance. And I danced, but I, I don't, I couldn't keep up with him, but. Okay, thank you for <laughs> your presentation. I have spent a lifetime in construction and I made notes on what a fabulous job you did there with all the natural materials. It's wonderful. So many congratulations to you. Well, be sure to look up that, if you're interested then look up that uh, digital report in the, in the University of Nebraska Library. Okay, well, from California, I hope they know where Nebraska is. <laughs> Oh, all you got to do is put my name in, in Google, Marvin Lieber, Nebraska Log Cabin, and it'll pop up. Okay, thank you. And I have had comments from people all over the country that said it was a, really a good report that I shouldn't have put it out free. I should have sold it, but that wasn't my intent to make any money off of that report. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, Cindy Wentz, you had a question. I have two questions, Marvin. Thank you so much, first of all. You don't know me, except I know who you are, because in 2003, you were my roommate's guide. And I remember just how courtly and polite you were every morning and evening coming to pick her up at the room. Um, my questions are this, did you have to um, make that mile long pass? And are you concerned about being um, kind of stuck in your cabin if it's raining or snowing as you age and might need you know medical help. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, 
I'm not sure how much longer I'll be down there for the winter. I, this winter, I was going to go back to Scotts Bluff, be close to my daughters, but the corona, the virus was so bad out there, I decided mm -hmm. I'd be better isolated where I was. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yet I had a cousin who was my age who had a heart problem and he was in the doctor's office and he died. So I yeah. guess when your time is up, it makes no difference where you're at. You're going to go. But yeah, well, I am concerned. The path. Did you have to do that mile long path? Clear, clear it. Oh, is there another question? Did you have to clear that mile long path? No, no. Uh, it's only wooded for about a third of the way and the rest of it's open prairie. And even uh, in the wood, it's you. not a dense woods. Thank and you. I might add, um, I have a all-terrain vehicle, a four-wheeler they call it, that I have a trail too that I could use to get in and out. And I got that after, after I got older, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Linda Kirk. Hi. Thank you so much for this. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but um, because I came in a little late. But how old were you when you started this project? You said your daughters helped you. I was 52. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And you said it took, what, four years to build? Yeah, that's essentially right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you build a place like that, you almost never get done because you're always seeing new things you need to add, but essentially finished in four years. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Glenn Beachy. Hi, Marvin. Uh, good to see your face again. I'm yeah, here with a shy Diane Brunswick. She doesn't want to be on the camera. Hi, Marvin. Oh, but hi, she Diane. Has, uh, she's probably displaying the, the stick you made that um, she uh, got in the auction yeah. for, for her father. Um, and my friend Ed McKee that I was traveling with back in 2018 uh, I believe is on the on the Zoom. I gave him the information anyway. And he and I spent a month hiking in Colorado. And then we got the wonderful opportunity to visit Marvin and stay in his cabin. And uh, we survived. And uh, we got out the mile long trail and uh, got back to Ohio safe and sound. Thanks so much for that. And thanks for your presentation tonight. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Yeah, I see you got the stick. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, love the stick. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. <laughs> I knew I was going to get that in the auction. So well, that I, was I obvious. <laughs> that was obvious. I could tell by the tone of your voice or no, you're going to get it. <laughs> well, thank you, so Glenn. How many, how many potatoes did you get? How many hundreds of pounds did you get this past year? 150 pounds. That lasts me for a winter. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I've had good luck with the potatoes. Okay, uh, next question from uh, Jim Books. Hi, Marvin, great presentation. Hey. It's been great visiting you over the years down, down there. Um, my question is, when you got started and you were down there a few years, how long did you think that lifestyle would be sustainable? I actually didn't figure I'd last more than two or three years. I saw this as a long-term family vacation place for myself, for my kids, for my grandkids. And I said, when the reality sets in, I'll be on for easier life and a second career. And 30 plus years later, I'm still there. <laughs> so, and I found out many of the things I thought were important in life really weren't very important. And many of the comforts really weren't that necessary. Oh my God. That answer it, Thanks. Jim? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Terry Nettles, you had a question? Um, I wanted to say, first of all, Marvin, that um, I really enjoyed, again, hearing your story. And you were so descriptive that I could picture in my mind everything that you were saying your process and your home and everything so and I enjoyed 
your stories and the quotes and everything. Um, the only question I have is if there were an emergency for you, would EMS be able to get back to you? And if so, how would you notify them? Well, I have a cell phone that works good down there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, right now, today, you'd have to have an all-trained vehicle or some way to get me out of there. So then but you would have, have to let them know that then, evidently, when you I'd called have, in. Yeah. Okay. But I'd call my brother. I, I had a, I could tell lots of stories, but in, in uh, 20, I don't remember the exact year right now, but one of the years I missed ski for light, I was ice skating on the Narbury River and I fell and I broke my leg. And I always say God was with me because I skated much alone that winter. And that day, my brother and nephew were down there with me. I'd called them up and said, the ice is incredible. You got to come down. And uh, I was, well, I couldn't even crawl across the ice. But that was January, and we had absolutely no snow, and the ground was frozen. And fortunately, I had a cell phone, and I was able to, well, my brother was with me, but I called my other brother at the farm and said, you know, last summer, you had to come down and get that lame bull and haul it out, take it to where you could get some veterinary assistance. I think you could get down that hill where, to the river where I'm at and haul me out. But then I had a little bit of humor left in me, but I said, I'm not going to jump in that trailer like the bull did. You're going to have to carry me out of here. <laughs> That's uh, great. I, and I'm looking forward to meeting you next year at Ski for Light. Oh, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Jerry Eagleson, you're next. Hi, Marvin. I Hello. wanted to know how much land do you have? And is it, what is there a reason? Do you know why that land had never been developed before? Because it sounds like it's pretty prime land. Well, um, first of all, I have 360 acres. And if you put that in a square, it would be about a mile by a half a mile. As far as development is concerned, this is farm country, ranch country. None of the land is developed. Um, it's all agricultural. It's either grazed by livestock or farmed for crops. And the nearest population center might be Norfolk, which is 100 miles away. That's too far to commute to work. And so we have, you know, every so many miles, there's another farm home. And, and that's changing a bit now as more and more people are looking for rural places to live. In fact, this pandemic has really changed things because people, some people are finding out they can work from home and they could possibly live where I do and still have a, have a job up town. That, well, it was good listening to you tell the story. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, next question is, uh, John Elliott, who I guess he gets the multitasking award because if I'm not mistaken, he's listening to this on his exercise bike. <laughs> hey, Marvin, uh, thank you very much. That's really a great presentation, very interesting. Um, I missed the first few minutes, my internet went down. So um, if you talked about this, forgive me for asking again, but I'm interested in your, your well. Um, how deep is it? Is it a, a, a alluvial aquifer that feeds you well? And are you concerned about any upstream potential contamination sources like uh, neighboring uh, uh, pasture land with livestock or your septic system. I don't know if you talked about a septic system or not, but anyway, uh, my wife and I have a little cabin up in the mountains in Colorado. So we have issues with some of these things too. So I'm, I'm really interested in how you deal with that. So thank you. I'm gonna mute. Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, well, my well is 25 foot deep which is oh, I think we uh, standard right where I'm at because once you get below that you get into shale mm -hmm. so if you have water it's a, it's it's 
And I'm not too concerned about contaminating the Narbar River. And the Narbar River flows from its grassland, native land. And so it's not uh, as susceptible as it would be if it was in a metropolitan area or even in farm country. Now they farm with so many chemicals and fertilizers that much of the farm water in Nebraska has to be filtered to be safe because of high nitrates. But because I'm in the river valley, which is fed from the native sand hills, it's, uh, it's good clear water. I've had it tested by the state that meets all the state standards for, for drinking water. And that's a whole other story of polluting our groundwater with agriculture, but I won't get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Cooler, you have a question. Hello, got me. Hey, Mark, you thank you for your presentation. Uh, just want to know, uh, have you ever, have you made ski trails up there for you to go skiing on? Every time it snows, I ski, but I have to make my own trails. In other words, it's true cross country. I make first tracks. Now, if you come down, you could follow me. You'd have a bit of a track. Okay, I appreciate that and hope to see you soon. You bet. Thank you. I also have a hill which works good for tubing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Joe took me tubing when we were in Colorado. He had a hard time talking to this old man in the dude, but it was fun. <laughs> yes, it was. We'll do it again. Okay, uh, Jean Larson. Well, hello, Marvin. It's Jean and Gordon Jean. here. Um, we did have the pleasure of visiting uh, Marvin's home and uh, shared one of his meals cooked on his stove. And I think we had brought in a decadent chocolate cream pie or something, which uh, wasn't usually eaten in, in his cabin. But um, one interesting thing was how Marvin washes his clothes. Oh, can you talk to that, Marvin? Yeah. Um, well, I have a antique washing machine operated by hand. It has a handle on it. You wave it back and forth and the water slops around. And you also have a hand wringer that you wring the clothes out to dry them. Then you hang them out in the line. And uh, it makes a good story. But to be honest with you, most of the time I haul up to town and use a laundromat. <laughs> <laughs> In the summertime when it's hot and you sweat every day, I, I heat water in the sun and I do use it then, but it's more of a human interest thing than a practical. Thank you, Gene. Um, we have a caller, last number digits are 3021. I'm not sure who that is. Hi, it's Deb Weiss. Hi, Hi Marvin. Deb. Hi, Dave. Well, hello, 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 everyone. Hi, Marvin. We skied together but in have, 1988 well, in Fairly, remember? It uh, what I was interested in. Well, yeah, we had a lot of rain. In fact, we had a, a number of wonderful outings to Stowe, Vermont, and we went to Mount Pelier. And so, even though there were days we couldn't ski, we did a lot of other wonderful things with um, Bruce Scharfenberg, you and I, and Diane. Devereaux. So it was a wonderful, wonderful week. Anyway, I really enjoyed the presentation. And I'm wondering how um, close is your nearest neighbor and your nearest town and how close are you to the family in terms of uh, distance for all these things? Well, Thanks. I'll brother, mute now. I, my, I have a brother that lives four miles away by road. And he has a, his wife and two sons that farm with him. Um, now my mind went blank. What was some of the other? Oh, the nearest neighbor. The nearest town? The nearest neighbor would be just across the river, which if I wade the water, is only about three quarters of a mile. But if I go by road, it's about 15 miles. Now, if I, wow. if I go up the hill to the county road, I have a cousin that lives a mile away. And a town, well, Butte, my hometown is 
300 people, that's six miles away. I'm 100 miles from a Walmart. That's kind of the way you judge <laughs> where you're living out there. Civilization. Where are your kids, Marvin? They're in western Nebraska, which is 300 miles from where I'm at. They're close to where we, they grew up in their high school days. So it's a treat when they visit. It's a treat for them and me both, yeah. And they really enjoy it. The, the five grandkids are now aged between 13 and 21. And I thought when they got to be teenagers, they might think it's not cool to go to grandpa's anymore. But no, it's something they look forward to. In fact, when my son, grandson got his first summer job, he didn't accept it until he made the company assure him that he could take a week off when the family all comes down to my place. And uh, the so-called discomforts of the place just don't seem to concern him at least. They, it's like camping out, except it's, it, it's in a large, warm, dry building, I guess. Compared to a little tent, it's, it's spacious. Well, thank you, Deb. Uh, next question is from Wendy. Thank you. Hi, Marvin. Again, um, such a great presentation. I, I so enjoyed it. And thanks for doing it for us. But I was curious, you mentioned your oven. And you mentioned how you shower and everything. But um, I'm having trouble picturing not having a refrigerator or a freezer. And I guess you don't have either of those. Is that correct? Uh, no, I have a, my solar panel produces enough electricity for lights, electric fan, powers up my cell phone, powers up my, um, my computer. And I also have a small refrigerator. It's very small, but it's very efficient. And so rather than freezing, you would can? Is that how um, you would preserve? Well, I, I can for a lot of preservers, but I also, I also have a freezer up, um, up at the end of the power line, I guess you'd call it. Ah. Up at, up at my mailbox, the power line comes down the road and I have a shack up there with a freezer in it. So when okay. I go get to, oh. yeah. I was just wondering if you, because if you go hunting and you have a large piece of meat or something, how you would save that? Yeah, I can quite a bit of it, but I also freeze it. I do both. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Uh, Terry Nettles has another question, I believe. Do you want to unmute, Terry? Well, there you are. No, I don't have any question. Maybe my hand probably didn't get lowered. So shall I oh, lower it? I'll take care of that. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Cindy had us another question. Hi. I have two more questions as I sit here. No one has mentioned indoor or outdoor plumbing yet for toilets. and I'm wondering about that, and I'm also wondering, um, it's, I, I would think when you first moved in, it was pre-internet, pre-cell phone, and um, I, I was wondering sort of about the before and after, which way is better? <laughs> um, I don't have any indoor plumbing. That's, okay. that's one of the inconveniences that I have here. Um, with the family, it would not be satisfactory with just one man, it's okay. I have yeah. a a well-constructed outhouse out back and the rest of my, my water, I, I carried it in the bucket. Um, yeah, that is. I would really miss my computer and my cell phone. I really would. I don't have a TV. I don't miss a TV, but I, I like the, uh, I guess the information I get from the computer as well as the ability to communicate. And uh, surprising enough, these electronic devices don't take much electricity. I can get enough power on a cloudy day to, to power what electricity I use. Great. Uh, Glenn Beachy. So um, uh, Diane actually had a question about the, um, the tree that you use to make the uh, hiking staffs. Is, is that a common tree in the area? Can you tell us a little bit about that? How are, and how are your trees, Marvin? Did you have- Diamond well is- are your Go ahead, trees Diane. Okay? Are your trees all right? 
Your diamond willows, are they okay? Are the health They're of gone. the trees okay? What? The diamond oh. willows are gone. Um, oh, they were I growing thought... on on islands, sandbar islands in the river, and I had a pretty pretty good site to collect them. But two years ago, exactly two years of the today on the 14th of March, we had a giant flood and the river was still frozen and all this ice come loose and anything in its path was small trees were crunched and these willows are all flattened out and they're sprouting back but it'll be a number of years before they're big enough to carve again. And does that kind of fill you in? I'm sorry to hear about that. I know that in your other presentation, you had mentioned that something happened to your diamond willows. And I was just curious what the status was. Well, um, I've only got two or three left because they're no more, I can't find anymore. I mean, these, this ice come down, there were chunks of ice that weighed 30 and 40 ton. I was able to calculate the weight of them. They were five and six foot thick. And when that, they took out not only the trees, but bridges. The, all the bridges on the lower river were gone. And it changed the landscape where I'm at on the wow. river. But that's I'm one of the fun the things about it, living in a natural environment, see how things respond. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your trees. Well, that diamond willow you have is pretty valuable because there aren't many more left. Yeah, yeah, yeah I knew that. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to get out one. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you. Good talking to you again. You too. And I see our friend uh, Gibb has a question. Okay. Hey, Marvin. So when you come to Ski for Light, thank you so much for what a great presentation. I'm going to share some stuff after we get offline here. <laughs> but I, uh, uh, what do you do when you come to Ski for Light? Everything must just freeze at your place. Yeah, I... Uh... I built that place so it would be maintenance free, more or less. I don't have to worry about the plumbing freezing up or I don't have to worry about the electricity going off. And when I go to ski for light, I just shut the door. And, uh, <laughs> and there's nothing, no water, no water lines to freeze, no gas lines to rupture. And any food I have left goes in my root cellar and it's there when I get back. You know, the, the year I broke my leg, you know, they hauled me off straight to the hospital I went from the, the surgeon floor to the hospital and went from there to the nursing home. And finally I got to where my kids could take care of me. And for three months, that place was abandoned with no planning ahead of time at all. We just shut the door and left. Everything was okay. So there's, there's something to be said about a simple lifestyle. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Marv. Uh, me along with all the 90 plus people that stayed all this the entire presentation I had two quick questions and i loved the analogy about um it's big enough what's just the rough square foot of the cabin and then i have a pickle question okay um <laughs> the ground floor is 384 square feet which if you add to the basement that doubles it and i also have a loft which adds some storage space and then of course there's the covered porch out front and then I have the separate building I call a wash house where I can heat up and, and take a bath in. So it's kind of like that little book I read. It's bigger than it looks. Cool. Um, I'd love to talk pickles to you next time we're together um, live, but do you have any favorite cucumber varieties that you use in your pickles? Yeah, I like Arkansas Little Leaf. The reason I use them is because they seem to be to very resistant to diseases and insects. I have better luck with them than anything else, and they're a pickling cucumber. Well, Arkansas what? Arkansas Little Leaf. Okay, L -A -T -T -L -E, great. L-A-T-T-L-E, Little Leaf. Thanks. Okay, we've got uh, three hands raised, so why don't we we'll, we'll call those the final three questions. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with Jerry. Hi, Marvin, you, when they were talking about being worried about your stuff when you were gone, have you, do you have much trouble with bears? There are no bears here, no. Oh, okay. No, no bears, no rattlesnakes. Um, very safe environment to live in. 
Okay, uh, Kathy, who's on her iPhone. Hi, um, what about furniture? Did you build your own furniture? And what kinds of furniture do you have, a hammock or? Um, I built some of my furniture. My, my kitchen table is, is, is hand built from oak wood. I built my beds. Uh, some of my other furniture I bought, most of it, I guess, either at used, used furniture stores or at, at auctions. I like wood furniture that I can refinish and more or less, but it's more or less maintenance free. It don't wear out like upholstery. Great, and I think uh, the last question, I believe, uh, I think that's you, Deb, if I remember your number correctly. Yeah, um, actually, um, it was akin to the question that Jerry had, whether you had any dangerous creature visitors, but you seem to indicate that you live in a pretty safe environment. Have you had any encounters with animals that created issues for you? whether they be bugs or, I mean, infestations of any kind or larger animals? You know, the biggest problem I have with animals you mentioned are bugs. There's a lots of wood ticks in the spring, lots of chiggers in the summer, lots of mosquitoes in the fall. That's one of the inconveniences of the living where I am. Now they're not, they're, um, as far as large animals, recently I did spot the tracks of a mountain lion, which for a couple of days had me concerned because that mountain lion come right down the trail I use at night. But uh, mountain lions have a large area they live in, hundreds of square miles, and I'm just hoping that this mountain lion moved on. Well, thanks for all those great questions this evening. Um, before I hand it back over to Wendy, I just want to, you know, give a the award for most virtual distance travel to Einar from Norway, uh, who's also up very, very late. And to, uh, to, I guess, second place would be Jolene down in the Caribbean, which um, that must be tough to take Jolene. So thank you for great questions. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Wendy. Okay, yeah. thanks, Dave. And I wanna just thank you so much, Marvin, for uh, what a great presentation. David, thank you, you were a stellar facilitator. And Tim, thank you for letting us use your account. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And um, if you want additional presentations down the road to kind of keep us all connected, um, let your president know and we'll see what we can do. That's Tim McCorkle. So thanks again, Marvin. It was wonderful and uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. Yeah, I just want to say, Wendy, thanks for your encouragement and taking care of all the details. My I would pleasure. I never even considered it had you not um, or I don't, I don't want to say pressure me, but you did it. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to Dave for the support, and giving me the confidence that this electronic device would work. And take yeah, and look, look at you. Now you know how to screen share. Yay. <laughs> you're, you're officially no longer a technology Luddite. You, That's uh, right. <laughs> you mentioned the 21st century, Norm, Marvin. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, Pretty I have impressive. A, yeah, very much. Okay, Thank well, thanks much. everybody. Very impressive. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you, it Dave. Was, this Thank was a very impressive, impressive presentation. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye.